Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Tilson Live. It's two o'clock. It is Tuesday. We are coming at you live on Facebook, live on YouTube, as we do each and every week. I'm Eric Allard, part of the fourth generation of the Tilson family, joined as I am each and every week by Don Dansler, Vice President of Marketing and Customer Experience. How are you, Don? I'm doing great. How are you? Super, doing super. Just here in the, uh, it, it is August. July Just is baking. over. Baking. <laughs> we are still, yeah, the weather forecast, the easiest job on the planet right now is a weatherman or weather woman in Texas. <laughs> it's There's hot. A lot of copy and paste on the 10 day forecast. A lot of copy and paste. Not a lot of uh, in depth, you know, nothing forming in the Gulf. Thankfully, yet. Mm -hmm. um, Knock on everything. We're just moving along, guys. So it is Tuesday. It is two o'clock. It is Tilson Live. We are here to answer any and all of your questions about building a home on your property. Tilson's been doing this. Well, we'll get to that later. So jump in. <laughs> tell us where you're watching from. Tell us where you're building. Tell us what part of the process that you are in. And we are looking forward to hearing from each and every single one of you. Like I said, live on Facebook, live on YouTube, um, probably live on Vimeo too for the three people over there who want to mm -hmm. watch just because you're just, I like, you're just cantankerous like that. Like you're not, you are ungovernable. You're not going to watch on YouTube or Facebook. You're going to Vimeo. I respect that. I'm all about ungovernable. I respect you knowing what Vimeo is. So. 100%. 100%. Yeah. It yeah. is the ad free version. So. Anyway, jump in, guys. Tell us where you're watching from, where you're building. We have a very special topic to talk about that actually is the biggest differentiator between building on your land and building in a subdivision. Teaser. Dawn, what are we talking about? Uh, we are going to talk about preparing your property um, because when you are building on your own lot, there is a lot of site development that um, probably the last time you bought a house, it kind of happened behind the scenes and it, it all happened before you ever signed on the dotted line. But in built on your lot, we're going to we're going to do it after you sign. So you get to, you know, develop this virgin land um, all all on your own with our help. But we're, we're starting from scratch. So we've got to get everything all set up. Yeah, and it is it is the biggest time frame differentiator. You know, mm -hmm. when, when y'all I know it may sound a little evasive when we're answering that question. We're like, well, how much time? How long does it take? How long does it take? How long does construction take? Like, well, we really kind of have a, a segmented piece to this process. Two two very different segments. And that is everything pre construction or preparation, which we'll talk about today, and then construction. So when right. we, typically when we answer the construction question, we're talking about construction, but we try to do a good job of telling you holistically what you're really looking at from start to finish. But this part that we're going to talk about today is the most customer involved part that we need your help with that is going to be most unfamiliar to you. So very, very important subject matter for someone considering building on their land, whether it's in Texas, whether it's with us or, or not, these are things you're going to have to get squared away. Um, before you start construction, ideally before you start construction. If you try to do them while you're under construction, it's going to be very, very painful and very difficult. So again, live on Facebook, guys, live on YouTube, jump in, tell us where you're watching from, tell us where you're building, what part of the process you're in. We love hearing from you. Uh, Dawn, I see YouTube is joining us. Yes. If somebody from Facebook could just say hi to us, it will know. I can see that we're running. I'm just not sure if comments are working. Um, we have Ashley. Hello from California. Eventually building in Republic Grand Ranch. Beautiful. Awesome. awesome. Welcome, Ashley. We've got David. Howdy. Watching from Indiana, Texas. Awesome. Okay. We've got Chris. He is in Michigan. Uh, we just signed to build the Canyon Sea in Blanco. Oh, congratulations, Chris. Congratulations. Thanks for trusting us, man. Awesome. Then we've got Todd, um, Barnes family moving from California, building a Breckenridge and Valley Mills out yes. of your new Waco office. We'll be doing our first walkthrough this Friday. Oh, very cool. Yeah, That's Valley cool. Mills, cool. beautiful spot, just right up Highway 6 from uh, our location there in Waco. Actually closer to Woodway, but it's a Waco address. But yeah, Valley mm -hmm. Mills is one of those one of those communities that we were really, really passionate about um, getting more into. Because um, we think, we feel like that's where that's where a lot of, a lot of Tilson type people are, 
are headed as uh, they get displaced by the people moving into Waco proper. So we know they're headed yes. that way. Um, and then we've got Skinny joining us from Florida. What's up, Skinny? Welcome back again, sir. Welcome Glad back. to have you. Um, and so, guys, obviously, drop your questions into the chat. We'll be talking about all things building on your land if you need to. But for sure, we're going to talk about site preparation. That's what we've got queued up. But we can answer questions about design. We can answer questions about uh, construction. We can answer questions about financing, questions about customization, obviously, site preparation, which we're here to talk about today. So ask us your questions. The whole point of this is to get you all familiar with the process, answer any questions you have, any uncertainties you think that are out there. We can talk rates. We can talk, like I said, financing, mortgage. Mm -hmm. We can talk whatever y'all want to talk about. That's what we're here to do. So drop the questions in the chat. All right. And then one last greeting. We've got Chandra. Hi, watching from work in Dallas, but have our final walkthrough tomorrow. And our angel. Oh, congratulations. Our congratulations. The finish line. Yes. All right. Well, let's get into it. All right. Let's go. All right. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today, just the kind of an overview, these are the topics that we're going to be covering. Um, just a little Tilson history, um, kind of you know, defining build on your land for those who aren't aren't familiar. Um, we're going to talk about pre-construction responsibilities and all the important documents you have to have before we get started. Um, Eric is going to talk to you about utilities and site access, and then we'll also talk about site planning and preparation. So history, um, why why we're the experts in what we do, it's 90 plus years that we have been building in Texas. Um, founded in 1932, Texas family owned and operated for four generations. We have built over 40,000 homes um, on our customers owned land throughout the state of Texas and on average 10 families per week are moving into their new Tilson home. Um, so, and it's exclusively what we do. Um, when we're talking about built on your lot, we just mean, you know, anything, it, basically you're bringing the property um, to the equation. So some people call it a lot, some people call it their land. You could be planning out a farm or ranch, it could be your retirement home, your second home, um, your lake property, vacation home, whatever it is. It's just basically, this is what we're talking about when it's having the home of your choice built on property that you already own. All right. So pre-construction responsibilities. So we are here um, as the, your builder to help you out with as much as we possibly can. But because it's built on your land, yours, yours is the operative word and you're the owner of the property. There's some things we can't do because we don't have the right to and they have to those these things need to come from the owners in most cases. Uh, the first is a 911 address. So you're going to need to be contacting your county and we can give you all of their information of who's who sets it up. But they're going to need to set up a 911 address. So that just, and the off chance that something happens on the property, we have some, we have an address to direct 911 to. Um, utility setups, um, you're going to need to be the one that opens up the accounts um, when we're dealing with power, um, if you're on county or city water, those types of things, because in a lot of cases, it's going to require the granting of an easement on your property. Um, so we need you to do that because we can't give away rights to your property. Um, permit application filings. In, in some counties, it's getting to be fewer, but in some counties, the property owner is the only one that can file for a permit. So we can help you prepare all that paperwork. We'll put it all together, but we might need you to actually file for the permit. Um, and then other responsibilities. So items that are not included in the base home that you may choose to do instead of us. So things like site clearing, septic systems, et cetera, anything that we'll talk about that when you're signing your agreement with, with us and lay out exactly what those are. Uh, and so before you build, there's going to be some, some necessary things. So you're going to need some important documents, utilities, site access, site plan, and preparation. And for the documents, there's going to be three types of things that we're going to need. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on the next slides. But you're going to need a deed and title insurance, um, your plat and your survey, and then a copy of any kind of deed restrictions or ACC guidelines um, that may, be, may apply to your property. Uh, so a deed. We need an official, an official deed. So this is the document that's proving ownership um, of of your property itself. And there's going to be certain things that need to be included on it in order for it to be legitimate. Um, the first is it's going to list the grantor, which is the, the person selling the property, and the grantee, the buyer. So whoever had the property before and who they're giving it to. It's going to contain a property description as it's recorded in the tax logs. 
Um, it might also have the sales price, but it's not necessary for that to be in there. Um, but it is absolutely necessary that the seller's signature is notarized and it has to be recorded with the county in order to be a valid deed. Say so well. that's what we're looking. Yeah. Someone it. else has to know that this happened. Yeah. So it's put into the public record. Um, mm -hmm. That's what it's. It, these are public records uh, and it can be called several different things. Actually, I wanted to add to that. So this one, the example here we have is called a special warranty deed. Could be called just a warranty deed. Could be called a gift deed. Could be called a warranty deed with vendor's lien. That typically means that there is money owed on it still. So and you're, it doesn't have to be paid off for us to build on it. So it, it, it may be called one of various things. Um, it could be called a general warranty deed. It could be called a sheriff's deed. Those would get a little interesting. So, oh. but but there's a number of of things it could be called. But when we say deed, it, it's really referring to all of any or all of those things. And we can actually help you locate this if you don't like. I don't have that. I got this land 27 years ago. We can get it. It's probably mm -hmm. recorded. It's probably available online, um, and we can be we can obtain it there. So. Okay, perfect. Um, title insurance. When you are acquiring new property, please, please always, always get a title policy, even if it's a gift property. Because what title insurance does is it guarantees the chain of legal ownership. So that company is going to look into all the history on the title, see if there are any liens in place, make sure that, ever, that when every time that that property has changed hands, that it did so cleanly and was recorded, that there was a deed showing everything that we were talking about before. Um, so that's just going to make sure everything's clear and make sure that you're, no one's coming at you um, 10 years from now saying, but the guy before owed me money on this with, with some type of disputed lien or judgment. Um, so request that policy from your title company as soon as your earnest money contract is signed so that they can open title and do all of the research of what's going on with that land. Um, the last thing is a boundary survey um, drawing. This is going to be a drawing of the property. Um, so it's going to show you where the corner pins are located. We are also going to need to make sure that those are flagged and visible um, on the property just so we can we can see those, those property lines in person. The other thing that a survey is going to show is all of your building lines, um, your easements and setbacks. So when you're looking at a piece of property, you know, on the one that's on the screen, those bold lines on the outside are the actual property boundaries. But then you'll see that there's a number of dotted lines um, on there. And that's where it's saying, um, you know, it's restricting where you can build um, a permanent permanent um, structure, basically. Um, so you still own the whole property, but you can't build anything permanent inside of those easements or those building setbacks. So you'll need to be watching those guidelines. So we're going to want a copy of that so we can plan out where we're going to we're going to place your home. Um, it's also going to give all the dimensions of the property. Um, you also want to look to make sure that it's showing your flood information. Um, and it does need to contain the RPLS seal and signature. So a registered surveyor. Yeah. And one of the important components of this is is we need to have the corner pins located or visible in some way. Um, mm -hmm. And either we can have that done with a surveyor or maybe you have the surveyor come out there and do that. But that's they get covered up, you know, rain and then expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction of the soil and the rebar kind of works its way down and pine needles and and leaves and rocks and all the things happen, grass and they get covered up and they get kind of difficult to find. So um, we got to have those, particularly on a tighter lot situation. Or if you're in this case, you know, the lot itself isn't tight, but this house is just about from build line to build line, you know, mm -hmm. so we would want to know exactly where this pin is and this pin is so that we can get this exact measure of this build line so we can put the house right up. We cannot be over this build line. So right, it's really important that they not just have the drawing, but that the physical flags be located and they can come out and they'll usually see a stake with an orange tape on it. And that's, that's how that works. Perfect. Um, and then if you were buying in a community, you were probably going to see some deed restrictions and covenants. And that's, these are just going to vary depending upon where the land is located. Um, it's going to come and cover things and depending upon how, how strict each, each thing is, it's going to talk about some home design requirements potentially. Um, what we're used to seeing in these is minimum square footage. Um, if you're in like a lakefront area, um, some of them have a maximum height requirement. Um, I'm sorry, Eric. Am the I Mac, you? The Mac Mouse has a mind of its own. <laughs> sorry, uh, in those situations, we've seen maximum height of of your your house so that you're not obstructing anyone else's view of the water. Um, a lot of times you'll see required materials. So what percent of the exterior has to be masonry? 
Um, what percent, you know, can you use siding? What types of siding? Uh, what types of roofing? Things like that. We'll see garage requirements. Does it have to be attached? Could it be detached? What direction do the bays need to need to face? What's the biggest one that you can have um, are, co are common ones. And in communities that have all of those restrictions, we're also going to see some plan approval guidelines. This is the committee that you send it to. Do they charge a fee to review it? All of that. Um, and then we also sometimes will see requirements for construction. What times can construction happen? How long is construction allowed to take? Do we Are we required to have a dumpster or not? Um, and what necessary deposits? So that's yeah, what This we're... is a, a big one, folks, to kind of read into. If, if you haven't bought land already, mm -hmm. definitely going to copy these. And, and just like the with the warranty deeds and those, these are recorded. Um, these are not, they, they have to be public record. So when they are, when a, when a developer goes to plat a deed restricted subdivision, like a Texas grand ranch, public grand ranch, you know, of all the ones in the hill country, those kind of things, they, they record the plat, but they also have to record the, the restrictions and the covenants. And so that those are of record and you have to comply with them. Right. Um, By buying the property, you're agreeing to comply. So. Yeah. And it, and it, I know over time, sometimes like, well, we make an exception for these people. And there are such things. There are variances. Mm -hmm. But my advice is don't ever rely on the variance. Don't rely on the exception. The rules are the rules. If they want to grant a, a variance or an exception, they can. But it depends on which way the wind's blowing, who's in power at that time. People are people. Uh, most systems are perfectly fine until humans get involved, and then we mess it up. <laughs> but so this is something to consider. Um, it's it's I, I've we've had a number of prospects or customers that they read the restrictions and they say one thing, yeah, but the neighbor down here he clearly didn't do that, so I'm going to buy and then I'll just do what he did. Well, that might have been 12 years ago when there was a different committee, three mm -hmm. different people that were on that architecture control committee, and now there's a new sheriff in town. And we're enforcing the rules. Or they may not have realized that he did it and they haven't fined him yet. Also, that. also yes. if they say they're going to give you a variance, get it in writing. Oh, yeah. No, we have, the variance has to be recorded as well. Yes. So you have to record the variance. You want the variance recorded. Um, mm -hmm. The reason being, when you go to, if you ever go to convey or sell that property, title company come up and say, hey, we noticed that you're over the build line by three feet. It's on your survey. Like, well, yeah, well, I got a variance for it. Where? Right. Uh, well, it was emailed to me to my Gmail account. I don't have that anymore. <laughs> Sorry. You got to have the variance recorded. So, yep. All right. Uh, we can probably pause here. There's a couple of questions, I think. There are guys, questions. yeah, drop your questions in the chat YouTube, Facebook, Vimeo. Drop your questions in. We'll answer every one of them. All right. Or gone, um, we've got. We've got Matt asking, the new Lone Star plan is great. If you build the V version with the vaulted foyer, vaulted great room, and vaulted extended rear porch, do you have to have two separate HVAC systems? It doesn't seem by looking at the plan to have any place to run uh, from one side of the house to the other. Um, well, great question, Matt, and and that would be probably true. There's some different, there's some chases and things we can do. The size of the, of the Lone Star, the way it is, it's probably going to have two different systems no matter what you do. Um, whether you do all those vaults or not, there might be a rare exception uh, because we're using spray foam now that, that you could get by with getting with one that is zoned. But I, I, I'm looking at the floor plan now and I, I'm I'm fairly certain that no matter what you do, you're going to wind up with two systems um, mm -hmm. on this home just, just because of the size of it. Um, it. It could manual J out or you can buy with one, like I said, but it, it, it's not going to be probably not going to be the most efficient. So it's going to be two systems, probably no matter what you do, but great question. Okay. Awesome. Um, Kathy is asking, does site prep include bringing in fill dirt or sand to raise elevation for a property in Calhoun Co County that is not on the water? The closest water is about three miles away. Um, and it's not intercoastal waterway, intercoastal waterway or, and not bay or surf. So okay. Not so on water. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Calhoun County, for those who don't know, that is down like Port Lavaca, and it's um, not in a special floodplain. Port O'Connor area. Got it. Okay. So that is there on the Texas coast. Um, and the answer to your question is it does include bringing in material, but it's inside the form boards. So, so for instance, uh, in Calhoun County, we're going to build the, the slab 14 and a half inches above whatever the natural ground is. Um, so it doesn't include a dirt pad per se. So we're not the, the, the elite, well, let me rephrase that. The pricing that you see on our website that it says, you know, from X to Y um, for Calhoun County, that does not include a, you know, two feet, three feet, four feet, whatever of compacted, of, of a compacted or uncompacted pad. So uh, it does include 
the fill sand. So we got 14 and a half inches of, of slab height. It includes obviously filling that with the sand and the concrete to do that, as well as a final grade all the way around to bring the dirt to within usually six or eight inches of the bottom of the slab and then slope it away. That is included. Um, I'll make sure I get the answer right. So elevation for property in Calhoun County that is not on the water, right? So we're not, you're not on the intercoastal. You're not, so your windstorm um, and closest water is about three miles away. And it's inter which sounds like a long way until there's like a hurricane. Then three miles pretty mm -hmm. close. Um, it's three miles away and it's intercoastal waterway and not bay or surf. Okay. So yeah, it, it's, anyway, that's what it includes. It includes slab 14 and a half inches high and then the, the dirt work to make that happen. If you feel like you want to or want us to get a bid on building a pad to build it up even higher than that, we can. You said it's not in a floodplain. I, what I would typically do when we go into our site evaluation, check out your neighbors on either mm -hmm. side, maybe across the street, see how high or low they are relative to where we – because we're going to shoot grade shots. We can shoot the top of their slab. We can shoot the middle of the road. We can shoot your neighbor across the street, their slab height. With lasers, road. laser heights. Laser, yeah, yeah lasers. We're measuring. We're, we're measuring. Yeah, we're not shooting. We're not shooting. That's a very good point. No, we're not going to actually shoot them. Um, but, but and, uh, and we're actually going to shoot them. We're going to shoot their houses. <laughs> so we're we're going to do all that, and and we can and we can say, hey, look, you know, all these you're going to be a foot higher than that guy. You're going to be eight inches lower than this person. You'll be a foot, you know, about the same as as this person over here. And really, the thing to do their neighbors knock on the door and ask, Hey, mm -hmm. have you had any flooding issues? When Harvey came through, do you have any issues? And, um, and, and just ask them and they'll tell right. you. Yeah. They'll, they'll tell you. All right. Um, we've got Ashley. I understand there are many factors, but on average, how much would it cost to add a garage to a plan? We watched an old Tilson video quoting 60 to 70 a square foot, but that was a two-year-old video. Well, thank you, Ashley, for understanding yes. that two years is in this last two a years, long time. an eternity. <laughs> Um, it, it really is going to depend by plan. So yeah, it, I mean, I would 70 a foot is, is probably a pretty close bet of what it's going to cost 70, maybe to 90 on some really extensive design with a lot of stone and steep roof pitches. And if it's got, you know, gables or dormers on the garage, but for, for the most part that that 70 a foot plus is going to get you pretty close. Okay. Um, Carolina is asking, do you know when the active floor plan will be available for the Casita on the Tilson website? Um, we are working on it because it was pointed out to us that now that we have the, the two bedroom Casita, we need to show um, more variety. I think we're actually going to go with the static version first um, while we're working on the active one because there's, after looking at it, there's actually only four options um, on the Casita because when once you put the two bedrooms, once you go to the two bedroom version, we assume you want the kitchenette. So both two bedroom versions of, include the kitchenette. You can add the kitchenette to the one bedroom, and then we have an extended rear porch um, that you can put on it. But hopefully we should have the static version up um, sometime next week. All right. It's a cool little house. Questions I see. It is a cool little house. Uh, all right. So, all right. guys, keep utilities. dropping your questions into the chat. Uh, I'm going to start talking about utilities and stuff. And, again, this is all in context of things that have to happen prior to construction. Mm -hmm. uh, at least be planned for. Some of these will happen during construction, but they ha you ha we have to have a plan for it and how it's going to get accomplished before we can start construction. And this is what takes some of that upfront time. This is happening. This, is, this stuff is happening while you're choosing your colors, while you're doing your loan approval, um, while you're making, you know, signing your final copy of the plans. These things are happening concurrently to when that is. And, and it really starts kicking off as soon as we meet you out there and do the site evaluation with your land preparation specialist, they, they're going to give you a list of, of stuff. Hey, here's stuff we got to go do. Here's stuff you need to do. They're there to, to be a liaison for you. If you need help getting a hold of a power company, if you need help getting a hold of a contractor, that's what they're there to do. If you want us to bid doing a professional property service, which is the way to do it. Um, Cause we have to fight it out with the contractor. We're going to be out there anyway. So mm -hmm. um, that's the way to do it. So let's talk power. Now, this is broadly speaking across the whole state, and it varies wildly across the state. Um, most of the areas we're building in, it's going to be with a co-op or a cooperative. So, you know, we, we got to determine how we're going to get power to the house, both for construction and your permanent power. What's the solution for construction or temporary power, if that's necessary? And what's the solution for permanent power? Um, this is one of the things that got really wildly out of hand uh, during the supply chain struggles the last couple of years. It's gotten a little bit better in round, but it has not all the way worked out. Mm -hmm. uh, so the one on the far left you see here starting out is is a very classic 
just a transformer in the in the very very back back there my okay yeah transformer way back here in the back and then pull 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 and then they've left a meter loop so this is all just power um, coiled up and this is a temporary power pole so we provide this well if we're going to be temporary power it's already included we take care of that and then the meter the power cup we'll set the power pole first where we're going to build the house they'll come out and run power lines and then they will hook the temporary pole up to power the meter is provided by the power company. We don't provide the meter. So once that meter's on there, that means that it has met their satisfaction and their specifications, and they will make it hot uh, where we can work off of it. And there's you know, a little bitty breaker box with a couple little plugs for us to run saws, compressors, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff on. This is getting to be more and more rare. <laughs> this was the norm for a long, long time. Real easy, real simple. Um, a lot of people are wanting underground power more frequently, and that's totally understandable. It's a nice, clean look. Um, and trees don't fall on it as much. So that's nice. So over here, um, this is like kind of a, a very typical of a hill country setup these days. So this is uh, probably a Purden House Electric Co-op kind of deal. Um, this is a rack system. And yes, this is, you would see this on your property. I know it looks a little bit commercially, but this is what uh, Purden House Electric and a lot of the ones out in the hill country are moving towards. Mm -hmm. They want um, a rack system built. And typically you have to have an electrician build that. They don't build the rack. Um, they'll and, and sometimes they do, sometimes they don't even provide this, um, the system here, the gut, that I call the gutter or the, the panel. Um, and then they'll come out and you can see where it's running underground into here. And then once it's past their, you know, happiness, they'll put a meter in it. And then you can see a little, little, uh, 110 outlet over here. Again, that's for us to work on. And then in this situation, this is both the permanent and the temporary power. Like this is the solution. This is what you'll work off of. And then, so one of these is, is power coming in from the power, from the grid. That's this big one here on the left. Okay. The other one is power going out from there to the home. So next to that is. So that's like a one and done for the power company. They're, they're not coming company, back. As is the one next to it. This is another one and done for the power company. Um, but this is overhead power that's coming in. And then they're coming down the power pole and putting a transformer uh, I'm sorry, transformers up here and putting a pedestal here. And the pedestal, you can barely see it, but it's got little 110 outlets on either side of it. So very similar setup. This is a permanent power solution along with a temporary. You can work off these outlets. And then very similar, it comes down off of here. So power is coming in from the grid from up here. And then it's coming out here to the house. And actually, in this case, it has go part one of it. This is a 400 service. So part of this goes to a barn and part of it goes to a house. So the servicing this one meter is servicing the barn and the home uh, from a 400 amp transformer on the overhead power. So it's overhead power lines, just like this one over here. But in, at the end, instead of coming overhead, they're coming down, going underground and going to it. Okay. And then finally, this is what's known as a member owned pole. So I think this is part analysis as well. So a little bit different solution um, coming in and it will be the pole will stay here. will remain here. It's overhead power. That's what there's a weather head up here. Uh, meter is on here. There'll be a, a panel here. And then we can either put the panel on the house, run underground from here to the house, or the panel can remain on here. And we can just put a cutoff at the house. So again, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Your electric company is going to have a lot of say in how this is done. Um, typically the only options you're going to give you are overhead or underground, um, with the exception of this one, you have no choice. This will be underground. Um, but we, most, what we see these days is even if it's overhead power, they're going underground from that last pole to the home. So, uh, but again, we can help you with this. We hook it up. We can hook it all up. We can get it bid for you, but this is something that there's a long lead time on. And we got to have power on these houses to build them and obviously to get them completed. All right. So that's power. Again, guys, drop your questions in. We know this can generate a lot of questions about what's my situation? What's that going to look like? So let's talk water. You got to have water. Um, our customers are either going to be on a water well, in other words, the, you're self-contained on your own property, or you're going to have some type of community water or municipal water, uh, which you will tap into. So if it's public, some type of community water, there will be some type of a tap fee. Um, they probably have a couple of different options, five eighths, three quarter inch, one inch, and they have different price points. And those price points include so many gallons in your first, in that month. And then everything over that, they have a, you, they have a price set for, 
Um, the alternative to that is drilling a well. So, um, and this is again, one of those things that there can be a very long lead time on, particularly in the mm -hmm. hill country. So get out ahead of that. We can help you with where the location needs to be. The septic location is going to drive this, or actually this drives the septic location because um, septics and water wells can only be within so many feet of each other. There's some parameters around that for obvious reasons. Um, and also takes into consideration your neighbor's water well and your neighbor's septic system. So those things are already in place. Those are going to have an impact potentially on where your stuff can go because they build radiuses around them and the, that thou shalt not inside these. Um but either way, we can help you with the setup and, and how this is ultimately going to be done. How do, Now, once we got the water there, how do we get rid of the water that we use? So that's the next thing. What do we do with the wastewater? The state of Texas is going to require that you have a plan on what to do with the wastewater before you go out willy-nilly start building a house. Um, and this is what's done with, typically with a perk test or percolation test. Uh, it can be done by a, a registered sanitarian or a PE, a, uh, an engineer. Uh, professional engineer, as long as they have their stamp. But typically, it's a registered sanitarian. They've been um, authorized by the TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. They've taken some tests. They understand the parameters. They understand, you know, how close it could be to the house, how many gallons per day, you know, a certain type of soil can handle. And that's what it comes down to. It comes down to your soil. This is a different soil test from the geotech that we do for your foundation. Right. This is truly to see... Hey, how, how fast does the wastewater leach into the ground? Now, obviously, the more sand there is, the better it percolates, just like coffee percolates through the filter. Um, the more clay it is, the less water it's going to be able to handle because it will hold that water. So um, that will determine how big, how many sprinkler heads you might need on an aerobic system, how many lineal feet of field line you would need on a conventional system. Um, yes, dispel the rumor, you can still do conventional systems not everywhere and it's there's some pretty strict parameters around them but they can still be done they're still perfectly legal um and they will work as long as the earth is still turning and gravity is still doing its thing so um aerobic systems nothing wrong with them they're 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 great because they work in really small spaces they are truly on-site sewage facilities ossf these are all permitted through your county so whatever county that you're building in they're going to have some type of an office or official that that uh, governs the application process for these we can help with these, um, but this is going to be really important to kind of the overall master plan of your layout. Where's the septic going to go? Mm -hmm. Where's the sprinkler head's going to go? Where's the water well going to be? Where's the driveway going to be? Where's power coming in from? This is the part of the process that takes some time and takes a lot of involvement from you, the customer, because we want it to be where you want it to be. So most of our customers are on a septic system. There's a permitting process. So typically, it's pretty simple. You submit a design um, to them. And um, they will approve it or not. If it's done within the parameters of TCEQ and you're showing and the, the whoever draws it, the sanitarian you know, who lays out the design is showing that it's not going onto someone else's property and it's not in, you know, it's not within whatever, 10 feet of the house, not spraying within 10 feet of the house. It's uh, not spraying on someone else's property. It's probably going to get approved. The only time it starts to get a little bit sticky is if you're in a floodplain. Um, they get a little twitchy about that uh, and how, how we're going to handle that or when there's a whole bunch of water wells around. They gotta, you may have to kind of navigate how that's to be done. Um, typically, the spray field does need to be cleared, at least underbrush. They really don't like it to have a bunch of trees in there. Um, but anyway, that's, we can help with it. Typically, two to four week process just depends. You know, They can have you go mm -hmm. back and revise it. Hey, we think that's not a big enough spray area and go from there. So. And, all, right. all right. So gas. Um, most of our homes are going to be all electric homes. So we've got a heat pump for your uh, HVAC system. But we have a number of customers that do opt to have some type of a fuel. So this could be for your cooking, you know, for your cooktop or your range. It could be for your uh, water heaters, furnaces, maybe for a uh, fireplace or um, outdoor cooking or something like that. Uh, you really got two options. You got natural gas, you got propane. Those are about your only options. Most of our customers where they're building, um, they're not going to have access to natural gas. It's just not, it's not sitting around. Uh, no one's run the gas lines. There's a few exceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so if you do want gas, it's going to be some type of a propane tank. So you've got two examples here. One's an above ground tank. Uh, and one is a tank that is buried. There are some subdivisions that require, if you're going to have a propane tank, you bury it. Totally fine. Uh, either way you want to do it doesn't make any difference. You can even paint this one look like a cow or a pig or something like that if you wanted to. Uh, you can rent these or you can buy them. Um, either way you want to do it. 
you can do it. There's pros and cons to both. If you got questions about that, we'd be glad to answer them. But um, that's how that's going to work. And again, that there's provisions of where they can be relative to the meters and relative to where power's coming in and all that kind of the dryer vent going out. So mm-hmm. we help you with all of this. But this is the planning that, that when, like Don was talking about on a subdivision. All this was already planned before you ever walked in the sales trailer. You know, yeah. It was already laid out. They knew where the meters were coming in. They knew where the water meter was going to be. They knew where the sewer tap was going to be. Like all We can put there. these five houses on this one lot. Correct. That's it. Yeah. yeah the, your level of customization was, here's your four colors of granite. Pick one. Like that was, and, and, and people think that's custom. So this Which is- Which elevation who, you want? No, not that one because your neighbor picked that one. <laughs> you can't have that one's across the street. In yeah. fact, I can't do that elevation anymore. Um, so anyway, that's um, gas. Most importantly- Side access. Uh, we do need all weather access. Now we can bid this and have this done for you uh, with one of our contractors. We'd be glad to do that. Or you can have it done. Um, a lot of people have it done when they're getting their site the, the site cleared. They'll they'll get it done. But um, and we're ha- the example we have here does have a culvert. So you'll see a lot of um, roads, particularly county roads. They have what's we call a ditch. Sometimes you're called a bar ditch. So the road is crowned in the middle and then it goes down to a ditch and then up to, to the lots. The point of the ditches is to carry water one way or the other um, to its ultimate drainage point that's been designed typically and accepted by the county. So how do we cross the ditch, right? I don't want to drive a car down a ditch. And so you put what's called a culvert in, which is a pipe. So the county will determine the size uh, of this culvert because they have, they've calculated how many cubic feet per minute that this ditch can move. Um, so it needs an 18 inch or 24 inch or two 24 inch culverts or whatever it is. They'll tell you what needs to be done um, based on your address. They'll come out, take a look at it. And then uh, either we can do that again, or you can, you can have it done, but that allows that water to f- keep flowing uh, when it, if it does ever rain again, water will flow at some point through these ditches, through the pipe, under your driveway and go, they need to be beefy enough to handle heavy, heavy equipment. So mm-hmm. 80,000 pound concrete trucks, 40,000 pound dump trucks. I, and I know it blows your mind. Circles are very strong. This right here, this will absolutely handle an 80,000 pound concrete truck all day. So it's about how it's installed and the type of material on top of it. This is a crushed limestone. So a great road base. Uh, you could leave your driveway this ultimately, or it becomes a wonderful base if you want to do a concrete drive. Awesome. We'll pause for some questions. All right. Uh, we got Julie saying, hey, y'all, just wanted to say hi. We're having some extra clearing ranch scaping done around our beautiful Tilson home this oh. week in 160 degrees in North Texas. Yeah, oh, it's cooking. it's cooking. Hi, Julie. Thanks for checking well, thanks in Thanks for with joining, us. yeah. Yeah. We got Ashley asking, can a cathedral ceiling be built on a Shiloh plan? If so, estimated cost. My husband is worried it'll be another $100,000 to get a cathedral. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's not going to be 100000 to do a cathedral on a, on a Shiloh. Um, the most expensive way you could do is if you did a cathedral ceiling that went out and onto a porch, if you added that to the back too. Uh, but yes, you can absolutely do a cathedral ceiling either way. You can do it side to side, kind of like what we've done in our Tampico model in Waco, or you can do it front to back. Um, as long as you're not doing a bonus room on top of the family room, if you're a bonus mm-hmm. room on top of the family room, can't do one there. But other than that, you absolutely can do a, a cathedral ceiling side to side or front to back on the Shiloh. Very flexible one story plan. And it's not a pre-designed option, so your design consultant can work with you to kind of determine how you want to do it and how much that's going to cost. Um, Kathy is asking, how many feet of line is included in price from the water well to the home? Great question. Uh, We include 50 feet of water line. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, that that brings up another one, Kathy, though, so I'm glad you asked. So you... uh... What's not included when you're doing a water well, what we don't have included is electrical from the house to the well. Uh, mostly because we don't know if the well's already there, if it's going to go in later. In a lot of cases, it is already there. And so we don't, and, and already working, so it's tied to power somewhere. That would be awesome because that means you already have power on your property. <laughs> but uh, the, the that's something else to consider is who's going to be hooking up the electrical to the water well if it's not already installed and done. And so we can do it, but it's not included in the price. So that's a great, great question. But yeah, the water line is, it does include 50 feet. Um, and then we can price it by the foot beyond that. So, Okay. All right. Um, Skinny is asking what happened to the Driftwood model home? Going through the site, I saw the Barton Springs model, which looks like the Driftwood. Did you guys rename it to the Barton Springs or is that a new model? What you do, uh, What I do, I know. 
So, uh, Skinny, you've been with us for a while, so you may have heard us say before how the Driftwood had a sister plan named the Cypress. Um, what we did, um, you know, we have a, a plan review team here at Tilson that goes through all of our plans and then updates them and decides which plans we're keeping and which ones we're, we're changing. When we got to the Driftwood and the Cypress, we decided to combine them into one plan. Um, and that is what the Barton Springs is. So we've done kind of a redesign of that plan. Um, and we did want to go ahead and rename it because one of the things that changed um, was the Driftwood plan included the garage, the Barton Springs, we've made the garage an option. So there are actually five different um, garages that you can choose and it's not included in the base plan. So we made the decision to go ahead and rename it just to try to help anybody who's watching old videos to not be confused that all this, you know, in the past, we'd be saying that the Driftwood included the garage and it doesn't anymore. So that was the reason for the, the rename of the Barton Springs. And so it shall be. And so it shall be. Um, Andy is saying we are at the Travis A house in Needville with Chris talking final details. We're so close. That's oh, awesome. very cool. Um, Sherilyn is asking, what is the cost difference between an aerobic and conventional septic system? Okay, Sherilyn, it's going to depend widely on where you're building. Um, and I was actually just going through and, and looking at that um, to see if I can find some more recent pricing on conventional systems. They're, they're just not done super, super frequently. Um, they're not, there's not a lot of cost savings. I can tell you that. Um, there's not, they're not a whole lot cheaper than uh, aerobic systems. Uh, permit's going to be the same. The, the um, perk test is going to be the same. And then these days, the installation, because there's so many people who do aerobic septic systems, there, there's not a lot of cost savings in doing conventional. And in fact, there have been a few occasions where I've actually seen the conventional cost more um, if some sand has to be hauled in, which does, does happen from time to time. Um, okay. They have to excavate some of the clay out, put bring sand in so they have enough clearance on the top and bottom. What you really have to have for conventional in a lot of cases is like three feet of sand. Um, for the field line, you, they want a foot for the for the actual pipe. They want a foot above that and a foot below that. So that's three feet. Uh, and she's um, saying she is Williamson County. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be t there's there's not going to be a big cost difference between the two. Uh, I'd, I'd budget somewhere around the let's see, I got Williamson pulled up. Yeah, the, I'd, <laughs> I'd I'd put somewhere in the in the sixteen to nineteen thousand dollar range for aerobic or conventional in that situation. Um, I know, I know some people say, well, you got to have, you know, it's maintenance on the aerobic system. Like it's already, you have to have a two year maintenance agreement, whether you do aerobic or conventional conventional true, that doesn't require any kind of power or anything like that. You still have to have it pumped out from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and you got to be sh very sure that you're doing like the, um, with, with conventional systems, you got to be a lot more diligent about like the rid X and tree root, uh, killer things like that because that's the stuff that causes you headache down the road with a conventional system is that tree roots like to grow where the moisture is and you're putting a lot of moisture in the soil in kind of one area over there and the tree roots are going to go i want over there mm -hmm. and so when they do that they get around your pipe and they get in your pipe and then it gets clogged and and so it's something it totally fine you can stay ahead of it but you gotta there is some maintenance required there not from a power or uh, equipment standpoint like there is on a on aerobic system because you got a compressor you got an aerator you got a sprinkler water pump thing so there's some there is some some components that can go out um but you can get in just as big of a mess with a uh, conventional system if you don't maintain the vegetation control okay um, Chris is asking, would it be helpful to see if PEC can connect service at the same time as a stakeout or is it better to wait? Um, you're probably going to have to wait because they're going to want to have an idea. They usually want us to flag it first um, where the house is going to go before they will even come out. Now, if that's not the case, then then maybe they can come out there. But I'd, I'd, I don't know what their time frame is now on completing work. They have five different little fiefdoms in PEC um, and they do not speak to each other and they do not follow the same <laughs> regulations or guidelines. Um, I don't know what, if they tell you they have or not, but we can tell you from experience they do not because we build in all five of their fiefdoms and <laughs> it is different. So yeah, I, I, I it, if they can, they can, that'd be awesome. Like this, mm -hmm. my answer to that is going to be the sooner the better. As soon as they will come out and, and hook up power, man, let's do it. Yeah, take but the date they'll give you. They're probably going to want the rack system to be built, uh, which we're not going to be prepared to have done by the time as early on as we do the site evaluation. So, okay. Um, Ashley's asking, how's the progress of the Paladuro model? Any potential completion date? 
we are pushing our completion to be end of November. Mm-hmm. Could be before that, but probably end of November to have it all done done. Um, so it's it's being trimmed. It's being uh, they got tile work going. Um, so we are we are fully inside. The electricians, I think, were there yesterday. Um, so that's where we are. Yeah, awesome. And then Skinny is asking, which is better for savings, the gas stove or the electric stove? Depends on what you're paying per kilowatt hour for your electricity, Skinny. So that's going to depend on um, what the co-op's pricing is um, and how much cooking you do. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I really needs to be a. I don't think I think it's going to be a a marginal savings one way or the other. I, you know, it, it's. Well, and how long would it take to balance out the cost of putting in the gas to? Yeah, I, to me, it'd be a preference, right? Like, if you yeah. prefer to cook on gas, man, put a gas stove in. Um, if you prefer to cook on electric and you like how clean the ceramic top is and all that, put that in. Um, if you like the coil top stuff, go buy a trailer. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) Shall we site plan? Let's talk about site plan. (laughs) All right, guys, keep dropping your questions in the chat. These are great questions. Um, and, and we'll answer every single one of them. All right, site evaluation and stakeout. We are going to meet you on the property. Uh, it's one of the first things that we do once we know what house you're building. Uh, if you've done our contract, then we're going to kind of draw a site plan up, uh, showing you know where we think the the power's coming in, where the house is to scale, where where you know we see septic probably water, all that, and then we'll talk about how we're going to clear that up. So, what happens at our site evaluation, or some refer to as the stakeout? Well, we're going to help you decide the best place of your home. Now, we don't decide. It is your decision. This is your mm-hmm. land. Build on your lot. Actually, our contract says owners shall specify in writing the location on the home of the home where the home is to be built. So we're going to help you, though. We'll tell you, hey, look, over here, maybe a better view, but I can save you some money if you build over here. Which would you prefer? So th- those are the kind of questions that are asked. What do you want your back porch to be looking? Where do you want your master bedroom windows looking? Where do you want your family room windows looking? Maybe where you want your front porch looking. We can help you with all that. Rotate the house. Do you want it squared with the road? Do you want it squared with your neighbors? Do you have a barn there? you want it squared with that? We help you with that. Um, and then we're determining needs, right? Like So we shoot grade shots. Um, like Don said, we take a laser, a level, and we determine how, how level or not the property is. Um, how much clearing needs to be done inside the footprint of the home and then maybe around the footprint of the home and then access, you know, do your neighbors, do you, do you need a culvert? Do you need, do you, can you just come and drive right off the road? You know, and a lot of this is, you can tell pretty easily looking up and down the road, what, what your neighbors have done. Mm-hmm. Um, if your neighbors on either side have culverts, you're probably going to have to have a culvert. <laughs> if your neighbors on either side do not, you probably don't. So, um, and, and this is a weird time right now. People are like, well, I can drive everywhere on my property. Like that's because it's, well, now August, it's been 100 degrees for 30 days straight, and it hasn't rained in a month. So, yes, there are not a lot of places you can't drive on right now. That will change come October, November, and we need that all-weather access. So we're going to set it up, and any recommendations we make will be to achieve all-weather access. We've got to be coming in in January, February, just like mm-hmm. we're coming in in, in uh, July and August. And we're going to measure for the water, your electrical, and then um, we will both leave with a list of, of a, a checklist of things that we need to get done. So people love their checklist. Do with yes. that. Dawn, tell us about this site plan. What are we looking at here? This- um, so the site plan, this this is a fancy one because um, this is a home that we built where um, the architectural review committee actually required us to submit a formal site plan. But this is what's actually showing exactly where the house is going to be. Um, so you're, you're going to see on there the house placement. It's also pointing out where the utility hookups are going to go, where the lines for the utilities are, as well as the stubs. Um, It's designating our septic placement as well as the spray field, um, showing all of our intentions for permanent driveways and culverts. Um, And then it includes everything from that original survey. So showing the building lines and the easements to document that we are not building our permanent structures um, outside of those lines. Then we're going to clear it. Um, So you'll see some, we or somebody, you, us, somebody, is going to clear the lot. Now, we've got some X's on on trees. These are just, you know, just real quick, important note. Be very clear with your clearing contractor, no pun intended, what the X's mean. Do the X's mm-hmm. mean trees go or X's mean trees stay? Sometimes you'll see orange tape wrapped around. So just kind of, um, just everybody needs to be on the same. It's like when you go to get an operation, <laughs> what leg are we operating on today? <laughs> I love and they okay. confirm it. Every, every person you talk to. <laughs> 
um, again, you can't you can't put these trees back. So you want to do that, you know, carefully, but but clearly. And then uh, after that's done, and oh, I want to mention the root, all the you see these root balls. The root balls are out, so these have got to go. Mm-hmm. Um, if if whoever's because we get some, there's some there's some. I'm not calling dishonest people, but certainly less disclosure type people out there that will say, oh, I can clear your lot. I'll cut all the trees down and it'll be a fraction of the cost. And they cut it off and leave the stumps. Stumps got to go. Right. Um, any, any organic material that could decay under your foundation and leave a void, we want it out of there. Um, and you want it out of there. And the engineer really wants it out of there. So we want it out and backfilled with some type of fill. Um, that's, that's the main thing is get the root balls out. This, this machine will do it all day long. Uh, 300 series excavator. This is yeah, my dream job. Just <laughs> hop in there, hydraulic thumb, just grab giant tree stumps, throw them. Okay, perfect. Yes, um, groundwork. So after that's all done, then uh, yeah. So actually, here they're probably laying uh, for a culvert and driveway, uh, putting out some material, put a good clay base down, and then put rock on top of that. But same thing. If we're doing a pad, this is the time when that would happen. Um, Otherwise, this the dump trucks would show up after the forms are set, uh, and then we fill the forms with material up to within about four inches of the top. So and then we make sure, you know, we're obviously part of our grade shots we do, we ensure that drainage is done so that water goes away from the property all the way around. It is your responsibility to maintain that drainage once we're gone. So it's a very important thing, again, once it starts raining again, to maintain. Yep. After all that is done, then we start construction. So, and, and the point of doing all that beforehand, folks, is so that construction goes smoothly. Like, we're not having to stop and say, oh, we forgot. How are we going to get – now we got to get uh, the water lines under the slab to the other side because the meter's back here and the septic – wait a minute. You, you don't want to be doing that at this point mm-hmm. in the game. You want to have all that planned, laid out, permitted, approved. Everybody's – you know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. Everybody's crystal clear so that once it goes to construction, we don't have any kind of hiccups like that. We just roll. Absolutely. And with that, this is the stuff we did. This is what yes. we talked about today. Now we want to talk to you about questions. Yes. Do you have questions? Um, let's see. I see we got a comment from Ashley. She was asking about the Polidoro. So she's scheduling her Texas trip for 2024 and wanted to make sure the Polidoro would be finished. It yes, will be it, finished by then. It will be finished. It absolutely will be. But yeah, folks, this will be kind of kind of last call for questions. We have a couple of housekeeping things we want to tell you mm-hmm. about. But uh, ask your questions, Facebook, YouTube, whatever. Drop them here in the chat. We'll answer every one of them. But Don, there's something happening this weekend. There happen- is. There is something happening this cold weekend. Front. It's a cold front. Oh, it's not a cold front. It's not a cold front. But <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but we are having the grand opening in Waco on Saturday. Um, so that's going to be a super fun event. We're very excited. All of those models are complete. They are fully furnished. They're ready to be toured. And so we are very excited to welcome everybody out there. Um, we're going to have a construction seminar uh, starting at 11 o'clock. Um, and we're, we're finalizing our seating for that. So if you have registered and are planning to attend the seminar, please let us know. Um, if you have not registered yet, please register. Cause we are, we are figuring out all of the chair situation. We may actually, we're probably going to have to do multiple seminars at the same time. So, yeah. um, the speaker may be a surprise for your group, <laughs> um, but. I know who it will be, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, Eric and I will both be there. So very excited to meet all It'll of you guys there. in person. Justin Ordno, our senior vice president of construction, mm-hmm. Nick Yates, VP of construction for that area. We'll all be there answering your questions, yep. uh, talking to you, mixing it up with you, meeting our, meeting our prospects, meeting our customers, talking to you guys and just like to get to know you. The yeah. whole Waco team, of course, which they're super stoked. I know they miss their trailer. I know they do. <laughs> they um, do not. Not even a little bit. <laughs> They missed their double wide. Um, and then we're also going to have a local food truck out there from 12 to 2 serving up lunch. And we'll have some some fun giveaways and some prizes out there. So we would love to see everybody. Um, Kathy is asking which models. We have a two-bedroom casita. We have the Angelina. And we also have the Tampico. So we have three models out there for you to Boom. see. All right. So uh, we got that going on. The Paladero is being built. We got mm-hmm. some uh, sneak stuff going on in Angleton. It may be happening soon. So yes. we've got some little other model uh, updating that we're doing in, in a few little places. So we're excited about those. Uh, what else? What else is going on? 
Lots of stuff. It seems like oh, everything. Skinny's got a question. Yeah, Skinny does have a question. He's asking, are you guys able to expand the bedroom square footage a little bit if we wanted to? Absolutely. Yeah. If you wanted to you wanted to make it bigger, we can absolutely, you know, do that for you. Um, we'll also give you some advice on, you know, if it's if it's a home that has a very symmetrical look, we might recommend that you also add square footage on the other side just to make sure that the exterior um, looks right. But yeah, we can absolutely add square footage to any of the rooms. All right. Um, David is asking, is there an option for a metal roof? There is, David. Yep, sure is. We we recommend a 24-gauge concealed fastener, standing seam metal. So concealed fastener is simply meaning that um, the screws aren't exposed. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that they make exterior screws, self-tapping. They have little rubber grommets, rubber gaskets on them. That's adorable. Um, and, and they'll Rubber work. gaskets don't do well in heat. They'll work for a little while, um, but they will. The, the Texas sun will eventually take them out to, and you'll be left with a, a gap of space. So the ones that we we install or our customers have installed are going to be concealed fastener. Uh, in other words, that the whatever panel is, this panel's here, the next panel goes on top of it and hides the screws from the elements. So great question. Okay. Awesome. Um, Becky is asking, can a bonus room be added to an Angelina? I would think so. I have yes. not played with that one. Did you play with that one? I am pretty sure. I think everything in that series has a bonus room. Has a bonus room. If not, we're blaming Chris Allard. That's what we're going to do. If not, we'll design one just for you. Um, <laughs> yes, it does have a bonus room. Oh, beautiful. It's got 565 square feet in it. There you go. Chris, Chris survives another day. All right. So, <laughs> all right, guys, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, upstairs. Yes, yeah, upstairs. That's, that's where it would be. Yeah, mm -hmm. We would have a bonus room upstairs. Um, and there's an option on the website to do that. So you can go to the interactive floor plan of the Angelina and you can play with doing that. What you can't do it with probably is the cathedral ceiling. So if, you, mm -hmm. if, if you're having issues with it, make sure the cathedral ceiling is not checked, uh, neither for the porch nor for the family room. And then outside of that, you should be able to have no problem putting the bonus room option onto the interactive floor plan of the Angelina on the website. If you have an issue with that, please let Don know. <laughs> Thank you. You can let me know, but I'm going to forward it to Don. That's what's going to happen. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> because we want it fixed, right? That's the whole point. You let me. <laughs> um, what you? Uh, it's kind of tricky, uh, Don. Maybe I'll share this real quick because it can be okay. a, little, a little sneaky. Um, let me see if I do this right. Uh, wait, wait. I can do this. I'm so good at this. All right. So on the interactive floor plan. You need to, right here, get a click over to the second floor. That's one that even I miss that uh, from time to time. So, well, you um, can also, if you scroll down, there's on the first floor, there's an option that says stairs to the to the bonus room. Right. Great Selecting point. one automatically selects the other, but it, that'll. So you can do that, and it shows you what happens down mm -hmm. here. Um, and then once you do that, then you can come up here to second floor, click to the right. And you click bonus room, and there you go. Yeah. Anyway, that's how that works. Very cool. Hopefully that helps. Um, oh, we got the late check-in. We got yeah, late check-in. We got Christian and Lisa Sumner with a late, late check-in. Our soil survey came back all good. Oh, that's awesome. You, you made it before. You did. You came right down to the wire. You got it. Crushed it. And congratulations. That's awesome. Yes, Great next that's step. That's awesome. All right. Thank you all for watching. Don, thanks for putting this together. Um, mm -hmm. We hope you, we hope you, oh, we got, oh, I can't, <laughs> yeah, old replats. Just about ready to light this candle, just waiting on the replat before we proceed. Well, that's good. Uh, we should, we should, that is something we should wait on. We don't want to, but we should wait on that. But yeah, guys, thank y'all for watching. We hope that you can join us this Saturday in Waco. I'd love to see y'all, mix it up with you. Um, maybe we can just, you know, run around outside. <laughs> Nice Play warm. some touch football. It's going to be, yeah, gonna be exactly. great outside weather. Oh, no, it's tackle only. So <laughs> uh, anyway, we'll be out there doing that. We, we are so grateful that you'll watch. Uh, you'll watch find me next to the nearest air conditioning vent. <laughs> Poor um, But yeah, we, we know we know these things help you guys out. We love hearing from you guys. Obviously, it doesn't have to end here. We don't have to end here. We got a website open 24-7 with new home coordinator. I'm sorry, with with new home specialists standing by. We have new home coordinators too. They help you once you get under, once, under yeah. contract. The real work begins. Um, they're, they're doing the heavy lifting. 
But we got uh, 12 design centers open seven days a week, Monday through Saturday, 10 to 6, Mondays, I'm sorry, Sundays, noon to 6. Uh, we got an Instagram page, got a Facebook page, got a YouTube channel that has every single one of these on there, um, and, along with a lot of other very informative videos and mm-hmm. customer testimonials and tours of their beautiful homes, of, of their, how they personalize them. And, and in fact, some that are their own custom homes that aren't even one of our plans. So go check those out. Um, always love hearing from you guys. Ask us anything you want to, anytime you want to. That's what we're here for is to make this process more familiar to you, less intimidating to you. It's really, really cool experience. We can make that independent vision come true for you and your family and hope you find these helpful. And until then, we hope to make you soon part of the Tilson family. Talk to you later. Bye, everybody.